What's going on guys, Cursed Havoc here, bringing you another Metal Gear Solid update video. And today this video specifically pertains to the currently in production Metal Gear Online 3. And uh, it's something very special because I've been, I've been making a list for the longest time now. And I've been meaning to make a video regarding this list, but I've never gotten around to it up until now. And what this list contains is a group of some of the main key points that made MGO2 one of the greatest online experiences that uh, anyone's ever really took taken part of. It was, uh, even though it was just for the PS3, it was still one of the greatest games that have ever been released, in my opinion. But this video is going to contain two parts. It's going to contain my list, as well as some updates, uh, news updates about Metal Gear Online 3 that Kojima has recently put out on his Twitter, as well as some pictures that have come from his Facebook page as well. Now, if you hear me clicking on a keyboard, the list is in a Microsoft Word document. I tried to print it out. I tried to make it easier, but no, of course not. It's not connected to my printer. So please have the patience with me. If you do hear the clicking in the background, I'll try to keep it minimal. Uh, I'm just scrolling through here because my memory is not worth, you know, anything anymore. <laughs> I'm 21 years old and it's not worth shit. So let's just put it that way. Anyway, so without any more bullshit, let's go ahead and continue. Anyway, the first aspect that we need in MGO3 that made MGO2 one of the greatest experiences was the need for everyone to aim for the head. And I know this has been talked about a lot by a lot of the MGO2 players, and it was one of the key things that have come up in discussions between me and my friends, or my friends and I for you grammar Nazis, but it made it made it its own game because there was nothing else like it. You aim for the head in this game and it was like, it was a skill to obtain. It was something that everyone had to figure out. Uh, in other games all you had to do was aim at someone, hit them, two, hit them three or four times and they dropped. Like in Call of Duty, Medal of Honor, other first person shooter games. And it just, you know, they never took any real skill. Metal Gear Online, if you wanted to get a, a kill fast, you had to know how to aim for the head. Okay, and um, uh, it's just, it was just too noob friendly. Like, the games Call of Duty, Medal of Honor, and other first person shooters are just too noob friendly. And what I mean by that goes back to the three to four bullets thing. You could aim anywhere on their body, and they took damage, and it took the equal amount of damage as if they were aiming for the head. So, it just, it just didn't seem like Call of Duty matched Metal Gear Online's skill capability. Like, you need to aim for the head in Metal Gear Online, otherwise, chances are the person you were shooting at already knew how to aim for the head, and they were going to end up killing you first. Now, the next thing up on my list is the whole Metal Gear Solid 4 third-person view and the character handling that came along with it. Now, what, I, what do I mean by character handling? I'll get into that in a minute, but as a long-time gamer, I have been a huge fan of third-person games or in Metal Gear's case, a third-person stealth action game. Now, the way in MGS4, the way the camera angles worked in Metal Gear Solid 4 was absolute perfection in my eyes. The way that you could not only see the awesome outfit you have put together for your character, but also the way you could peek around corners and such was just absolutely amazing. The, the second part to this is the concept of how the feel and handling of the character impacted the player. Uh, like I said before, a few of my friends have discussed this with me, and I completely agree with them, but in MGO2, it had this type of instant input recognition. Uh, for instance, if you were running forward, okay, just picture your character running along the path in bloodbath, heading towards the, uh, the goal. If you were running forward, uh, all you had to do by tilting the analog stick forward, and then suddenly tilting it to the left, your character would instantly go left. Like, there was no hesitation. Uh, he would just instantly go in that direction. And that played a crucial role in learning how to aim and quickly staying aimed on a head level. So that goes back to the head, the need for headshots in the MGO world. But this character handling, it just made it easier to made it easier to navigate the map and navigate the controls when you, when you were aiming. All that sort of stuff, and it, like I said, it played a crucial role in what MGO2 stood for. Next thing up was one of the biggest key points, if not the biggest, was character customization. Now, the variety of gear that each character was able to acquire was an awesome feature to add on to 
the game. Buying gear from a, a website that Kojima and Konami created, the reward shop, or winning it off a tournament made an excellent addition to the online experience. It gave players the incentive to play every weekend for the tournaments. Now, I know a lot of you had jobs and stuff, but still, people made times to take to play these tournaments to gain the special prize items or play during the week to obtain reward points from survival in order to buy the gear from the shop. Uh, regardless, it was one of my favorite things to do, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm sure a lot of you enjoyed the whole survival tournament aspect. I know a lot of you enjoyed those because, like I said before, many times I've discussed this with friends. I've discussed this with other fanatics. It was just, it was amazing. No other, no other game has done something like that. And um, the character creation process was amazing for first-time players as well as people who have been playing these games for a while who just wanted to create a new character. The gear that was provided was not the best, sure, but it was still cool to start with. Like some of the, the fleece cap, the helmets, the goggles, all that good stuff that you started off with. The base colors, everything. Uh, then you would pick up a preset head that gave the character an overall look based on which head you picked. And uh, there were about six or seven options, not to mention uh, picking a preset voice from one of those six or seven options as well. Another huge thing that people have told me about was the levels, the, the leveling system and the GP system. Uh, while it was a way for other players to judge you, it also made the game more unique. It made the game what it was and it made it stand out among other games. MGO was one of the only games I have played so far that allows you to D-level. And what I mean by D-level is if you do bad in a match, any type of match, official or otherwise, you c you run the risk of possibly losing that level. If you were 17, you went to 16, 15 to 14. Uh, GP was the same way. You were A+, plus, you go down to A, or uh, from there to A-. minus. It was amazing. It gave you, it, it, it was a method to make you want to get better at the game. And at first, yeah, it was irritating because a lot of players in the game were far superior than myself, along with a lot of the people that played the game. Thus resulting in, you know, a loss of a few levels when you were going up against them. Um, GP worked the same way. Only GP, you could lose it in tournament and survival. And it still worked. You know, people were much better than you and they kicked your ass. You lost a lot of it because of it. Now, however, the more I played, the better I got and the higher in rank I became. And just that works the same for every other player that played MGO, I believe. The, the better you got at the game, the more confident you became and the better off your stats were. Now, I enjoyed it because it gave me something to work towards, and honestly, I think MGO was the only game that I actually required skill to play, uh, that anyone actually required skill to play, and that's what made me enjoy it so much. Not just anyone would play it, not just anyone could play it, I should say, like the Call of Duty series. Anyone can jump right into the Call of Duty series, be, you know, shit to average at first, and then the next thing you know, yeah, they know how to aim down sights, they know how to throw this, they know how to do that, and Call of Duty just takes no skill to play, because, you know, people are like, oh, I'm 10th prestige, I'm 9th prestige, whatever, yeah, that just means you've been playing the game a lot, it doesn't mean jack shit, in this game, in MGO, if you were level 18 to 20, that means you have been kicking ass, you have not been doing bad, everything has been going your way, because you, like I said, this game ran the risk of you losing some of the stats you have created, like your level and GP. So if someone was a high level, you know damn well they were good at the game. Either that or they boosted, but even then, you could usually tell by looking at their stats whether or not they boosted. If they had an excessive amount of kills to deaths for the week, then that's usually how it looked. Next up, clans. MGO had one of the most unique methods to creating clans. As much as I hate to keep comparing this game to Call of Duty, I will do it again. For the latest COD game releases, they have given us something known as COD Elite. I'm sure most of you have seen this. I'm sure most of you are a part of it if you play Call of Duty. It is a player profile that allows you to view stats, join clans, or just check out some of its other features. Uh, I haven't been on the website that much. I do know I'm in one clan on MG, uh, MG, Wow, <laughs> I am in one clan on MW3, but let's be honest, who plays MW3 anymore? Uh, for MGO, no, for MGNO, man, I can't talk today. For MGO, in order to create a clan, all you had to do was go to the clan tab and then hit join or create from a clan from the menu, from the menu that popped up. Uh, next up to create. You would type in a cool clan name that you could think of, give the clan a description for applicants to read, and then you hit create. It was simple as that. Anyone could do it, provided they had at least 20 hours worth of gameplay on that specific character. And uh, 
I'll go into detail on that in a minute for the uh, for the the way I said specific character. Uh, most of you know you could have like eight characters, and for those of you that don't know, I'll go into that in just a second. And um, joining a clan was easy as well. If you knew the name of the clan, all you had to do was search it in the Find Clans tab. Uh, you would submit your application within a few sentences that the leader would see, and that was all you had to do. It made life a lot easier than having to quit the game, go to a different website, in order to submit the application like Cod Elite does. Once the leader logged in, a notification would pop up and he would view the application. From there, he or she could simply de accept it or deny it. It was that easy. Going back to what I said about specific character, the next key element in MGO2 was the ability of having unique names versus your PSN. And what I mean by that is MGO2 had this thing called Konami ID, and then you had your game ID for MGO MGS4. And it, it worked in two different ways. What this allowed for is that whenever you made your own character, whatever name you might have given him or her was the name that showed up to all of the players online. For instance, it was not based off of your PSN. You did not have to make a new PSN in order to have a different name. You could create up to seven characters with all different names of all different shapes and sizes, and it would all be on the same PSN. You could even switch PSNs and still have all your characters on there. Why? Because it was linked, the game ID, which contains your characters, was linked to your Konami ID, which you created on the Konami website. It did not base it off your PSN whatsoever, because upon opening the MGO option from the main menu, you would be greeted with a game ID and password login. You put the info in, and it opened up to all of your characters that you, uh, you could create or already created. You could also have multiple accounts with up to seven characters per account. I remember when I played MGO2, one of my friends quit and gave me his account. I had about 14 characters total, okay? That's a lot of people, if you guys remember playing that game. And um, if you were to create a new account, however, you would have to buy the expansions and codec me uh, pack messages for that account as well. You couldn't transfer those. At least, I don't think you could. Not legally, of course. <laughs> but anyway, a minor downside to having multiple accounts was the whole idea of uh, transferring your, or not even not even be a being able to transfer the expansions and codec packs. Uh, that was like the only downside to it. But you know what? A few extra bucks here and there was not going to be the end of the world. Bottom line, having the ability to have whatever name you want for your character without having to make a, P a new PSN was a huge relief, and it has to be on MGO3. One of those things that just has to happen. Next up, we talk about the Drebin Point system that was available not only in MGS4, but on MGO2 as well. Drebin Points in MGO was a specific game setting to play by. When you start off in the games that had the, that had the Drebin Point system as a setting, because you could turn it on and off, you could make a level and not have it on or have it on, and uh, based on what you do, you got different weapons to start off with. Now, if you did have it on, you start off with 1,000 Drebin Points. And every kill you got, got you more DP, or Drebin points, to buy a better weapon with, or continue buying the same weapon. You were allowed to upgrade with whatever weapon you had in attachment uh, while you were in the middle of the game. So you die, you go back to the screen where you get to choose your class, pretty much. And uh, it wasn't like Call of Duty where you had to switch real fast if you died. They actually took you back to a screen where you got to choose your stuff before you spawned again, if you wanted to. And um, you, you were able to do that in-game. Uh, attachments ranged from a simple silencer to a grenade launcher that shot almost any type of grenade, including frags, white phosphorus, and smokes. I think stun grenades were a part of that too. I don't remember, but it's been a while. It was a method to work for better weapons during the match, which obviously allowed for a slight edge over the competition due to increased accuracy for some of the higher point weapons. Definitely something that has to be an MGO3. Another thing, skills. The skills that were given to each character at the moment of creation were also another unique thing that I've enjoyed a lot, and I know I'm not the only one. The more you used a certain skill, the more it leveled up, and thus resulted in a more powerful skill set. My personal favorites that lasted me throughout the four years that MGO existed were Monomania, Assault Rifle Plus, and, and Runner. It was a classic combination among, uh, I don't want to say pros because that sounds a little stuck up, but it was a classic combination for a lot of the players. Uh, my favorite combination amongst those three was Runner 2 and Assault Rifle Plus 2. And like I said, these were definitely skills that a lot of people used. And I think I could compare skills to perks from Call of Duty. If skills were to MGO what perks were to Call of Duty. They were kind of interchangeable. Last but not least, the multiplayer maps were amazing because the first five or so that were released 
were maps based on the locales that Snake visited during his campaign, and what I mean by that is during the Metal Gear Solid 4 story. The DLC maps were also a combination of these locales, as well as Konami's own design that made for some awesome places to play on. Plus, I thought it was rather clever to name the maps with two of the same letters. For instance, Ambush Alley, AA, Bloodbath BB, Midtown Maelstrom, MM, and the list went on down the alphabet, with the exception of a few letters. But regardless, it was obvious that the levels were well thought out, and I think it gave the player a sense of nostalgia because some were from the previous MGO. The only difference was that they were ma remade under a different name with enhanced graphics to make it look a hell of a lot better than the original. When the original actually came out as part of Metal Gear... Uh, Solid 3, they actually remade that game into Substance, and then they released an online variant for the game with Substance, but it's no longer active. Now the reason I keep comparing MGO to COD throughout this video is that it seems like every major game company nowadays makes a multiplayer based on the success, quote unquote, of the Call of Duty games, and to be honest, it's getting a little tiresome to see first person shooter after first person shooter after first person shooter being released, and yet nothing can compare to MGO's awesome experience. There honestly is nothing that can even come close to how amazing that game was. As an American gamer who is currently living in America, I think I could speak for the majority of the MGO community when I say that it, w that it just, I just want an enhanced version of the MGO 2 in MGO 3, that's about it. Like, a lot of us are, keep saying, I just want MGO2 only with better graphics, guns, yada yada yada. And I think that that's what it ultimately boils down to. So if Kojima or Konami ever sees this, I want them to know that despite the fact that MGO wasn't very popular in America, the Americans that played the game were absolutely thrilled with the experience. We truly enjoyed the Japanese feel, quote unquote, for a third person online game. Because most of you remember uh, Konami or Kojima actually made a statement saying that it was really popular in Jap and Japanese. Wow, it was really popular in Japan, but it was not as popular in NA or EU. Now, if you guys agree with all that I've said in this video, please help me get this message across the web and hopefully into Konami's office at some point in time. I know MGO3 is currently in production and they've gotten pretty far with it, so we got to make sure that this outcome is in our the consumer's hands. Now, share this video on Facebook, Twitter, or whatever other popular networking site you guys know about. Because we're just I'm just trying to get this word out there. I'm not asking you to do it so I get likes and shares on this video. I want you to do it if you agree with me and you want to see MGO3 be even better than MGO2. And I know you guys want to. And I believe that as an MGO, MGS community, we can do this. I have faith in you guys because I know the majority of you enjoyed this game just as much as I did. And for those of you saying, oh, well, they're not going to listen to us, you know... Uh, we could send in all the complaints we want, they're not going to listen to us. And you know what, that may be the case, and we just let them do MGO3 however they're doing it currently. But, keep this in mind, there are two games that come to mind that actually had things changed about them due to pet petitions that fans wrote up to them. Uh, one thing, Mass Effect 3's ending, a lot of you know about that. People were not thrilled with Mass Effect 3's ending. I played the game. I enjoyed it. I didn't really care too much for the ending. It was a great game regardless. They could have just left it as it was and I would have still been happy. But that's not the point. Let's get back to what I was talking about. Players created a petition so that... Uh, God, was it Bioware that made that game? I feel kind of bad for not knowing. For not knowing but uh, they wrote a petition to them for them to change the ending. And they re actually released a DLC pack for them because of that petition so that they could have an easily understandable ending because I understand that the ending of that game was a little hazy you couldn't really understand what was going on and all that good stuff but anyway that was Mass Effect 3 another game that I can think of off the top of my head Assassin's Creed 3 when you beat the game for those of you that have beat the game I'm about to spoil it for you well not really spoil it for you don't even worry about it but when you beat the game the uh, Connor's hood is kept off now there's a, there's a mission at the end of the game where he takes his hood off and puts some war paint on his face because he's an Indian and he's going after the final boss. Now, because people signed, wrote up a petition and sent it in to Ubisoft, they actually put in a patch where they put Connor's hood back on. Something so simple. They actually put in a patch just so people would be happy with the rest of the, their, their experience on Assassin's Creed 3. So for us to actually uh, share this video around and get people's attention on it, I think we can actually pull this off just like what happened with Mass Effect 3 and Assassin's Creed 3. And who knows, there might be more games that uh, people have submitted petitions to to get their attention and to get, you know, 
get what they want ultimately. Now, I'm not trying to change MGO3 to be a shit game, because who knows, maybe some of you don't want MGO3 to be MGO2. A lot of people I've talked to do want it to be MGO2, only with a much better, much better uh, gameplay, different graphics, different weapons, uh, different, you know, gear perhaps even, and all that good stuff. So please guys, help me try to get this message out there. Alright guys, I promised the second part of this video was the updates that I received from the Kojima tweets. And uh, it actually comes straight from his Twitter. He, he quotes, MGO, MGO's been developed at LA Studio by our elite staffs. Core P and original MGO dev staffs check frequently. Now what I'm getting from this, this tweet, the vibes I'm getting from this tweet, is that people who made MGO2 are checking up on the LA Studio staff that are currently making MGO3. So even more hope to this cause that we keep discussing amongst ourselves, but never really voice out about. So definitely something to look at, definitely something to keep in mind, and definitely something to be hopeful for. Next up was something that I actually saw on Facebook while I was in the process of making this, this video for you guys. It's something else that he said on his Twitter, and I quote, people at LA Studio showed me the MGO that they are working with looked promising. Definitely some strong words from Mr. Ko Mr. Kojima, and I am definitely looking forward to seeing at least a preview, maybe a trailer, and then eventually the beta, and eventually the full-fledged MGO3 as they've created it. Now, thank you so much, guys, for your attention. Thank you, guys, for sticking through me, sticking through this video this long with me. And I, and once again, please, please, please get this video shouted out amongst the. Uh, social networking sites let people see it let's see if we can get it out there and let's see if we can make mgo3 an, um, an amazing blowout experience just as much as mgo2 was if not even more so so until next time guys this has been cursed and i'm out peace